Hi, I'm Conrad Marshall, and from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is Good Weekend Talks, a magazine for your ears in which we take a deep dive into the definitive stories of the day. Every week you can download new episodes in which top journalists from across our newsrooms host conversations with the people capturing the imagination of Australians right now. Before we begin today's episode, are you a regular listener to Good Weekend Talks? If so, we'd love to hear from you about what you enjoy most. Which episodes are your favourites and why? Drop us a line in the comments section of the app to let us know how we're going and what you want to hear. On today's episode, we speak to Lucinda Williams. The multiple Grammy Award winning singer made time to chat with us from Nashville about everything from the power of protest songs to America as a divided nation, her outrage at banning books and the need for truth in art, as well as performing on stage with the one and only Bruce Springsteen. And hosting this conversation with Lucinda about life after her recent stroke and writing her new memoir, Don't Tell Anybody the Secrets I Told You, is senior culture writer for The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald, Kerry O'Brien. I have just been reading your memoir, Lucinda. It is fabulous. Thank you. It certainly is sort of filled with secrets. I feel like there's a background story there that, you know, you're sharing with the world. Yeah. Is it quite a thing to put to put that out there and, and reveal all those truths? You know, I kind of liked being able to do that because I finally could get the story straight. There were so many things that people wondered about, you know, how did this happen? Did this happen this way or whatever it was, you know? And I'd been talking about some of it on stage when I would perform and, you know, with sing, I'd sing one of my songs and I would tell a story behind the song. But it, I knew people wanted to know more, you know, and I wasn't able to talk about everything on stage because it would just take too long. Mm-hmm. So this was a good outlet, you know, to be able to get the stories across and finally set the story straight, kind of. Yes, absolutely. You know, so. The one and only Lucinda Williams. And how does writing a memoir compare to songwriting? A lot of people have asked me about that. It's really different. Thank you. Completely different. I'd never written a book before and didn't know how to st- get started. And, you know, and, I mean, when I sit down and write a song, I've done it so many times. You know, I know what to do and I know it. I'm familiar with the process, but... I wasn't familiar with the process when it came to writing a book. You know, I didn't know if I had to sit down and write everything all at once or just pieces of it at different times or, you know, how that all worked. And, of course, I discovered that there really aren't any fast rules when it comes to writing a book or when it comes to writing an autobiography, I mean. Yes. You know, because I read several other autobiographies before I started mine, because I wanted to see what how other people were doing theirs. Mm. And, you know, they're all different. Yes. Were there any highlights in those that you read? Yes. I, I, re- I loved um, Chrissy Hines, mm-hmm. you know, from The Pretenders. Yes. Rick, Ricky Lee Jones was really good. Carly Simon, The Boys in the Trees. Mm. And I read Jeff Tweedy's. Ah, uh, great. You know, for Wilco. Yep. Yeah. And um, Bruce Springsteen's. Uh huh. Yes. Of course. His was amazing. I mean, it's just so well written. Mm. You know, I was worried I wouldn't be able to remember enough things, but somehow I did. Part of it, I, the way I started out by just doing some interviews and sitting down and talking and recording it. And I found that the more I talked about something, the more I would remember. Right. You know, so you kind of just have to exercise your brain like that, mm, you know. Yes. Just just start talking about stuff from your childhood and then more and more stuff will start coming out. Mm. And did you give yourself a dedicated amount of time or did you have a deadline yes. looming, no doubt? <laughs> yes, that was the hard part yep. was the deadline. Mm. Yes. And, the, you know, the editor was very strict about this deadline and 
that was what was different about, you know, between writing a book like that for a publishing company and writing songs where I'm just, when I'm writing a song, I'm, there's nobody, you know, looking over my shoulder telling me I have to be finished with the song by a certain time. Mm. But, you know, with the book it was more like I would forget to put certain things in that I wanted to. I would think later, oh, I forgot to add this or that, you know, whatever it was. And it, I, it would be too late. You know, there's no time. The book's coming out. You know, you just got to let it go. That's it. Unlike you a know, song so. which you could tinker with all along the way. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And when you say you interviewed people, did you interview um, from reading the book? It looks like everyone from sort of people that knew your father through to musicians you were yeah. working with at the time. It was just, yeah, everybody from old high school friends to family members, you know, because everyone remembers things differently. Mm. You know, so it would be really interesting, some of the stories that would come out, you know. Definitely. Like stuff I didn't remember but, you know, they would remember. Mm, mm. So, you were quite respectful yeah. about that. I, I remember with your partner at the time you wrote Car Wheels on a Gravel Road, he said that you wrote when you were feeling quite sort of not quite depressed, but, you know, when you were having a, a tricky time, a difficult time. Yeah, and troubled. You, troubled, or, yes. And you said, uh, I don't necessarily agree, but he has his right to think that or he might be right, almost as though there could be several truths, which I guess is the reality of our world, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. I mean, you know, I guess it helps to have have had some, you know, situations that were troubling or difficult, mm. certainly, but... I don't necessarily write when I'm in the thick of it. Right. You know, I have to, I have to let it go by and then find some peaceful moment mm. to actually sit down and write something. Yes. You know, it's, I don't I don't feel like creating when I'm if I'm depressed and in a bad mood and all that. You know, that's not that's not good for writing for me. Mm. I have to have some sense of well being and kind of calmness, you know, before I can sit down and work on a song like that. Mm -hmm. But I can draw from the experience. Yes. You know, that's the thing. I can draw from it, you know, and that's what I do all the time. That's usually what I do is just draw from things that happened before. Yeah. It makes me think about particular songs. Uh, Your work ranges across really everything in terms of life, but I guess particularly maybe uh, relationships and love and grief and loss and I think um, Change the Locks is one of the best breakup songs I've possibly oh, ever heard. Thank you. <laughs> I changed the lock on my front door so you can't see me anymore and you can't come inside my house and you can't I wonder in terms of your writing process, I know you've said it's difficult to explain, but it does sound like you'll note things down. You're a bit of a bower bird. You keep yeah. details and maybe yeah. sit down with those in, in a folder or something and, yeah. uh, and look at them. Can you talk us through what that what that looks like as much as you can? Yeah. Well, I want to start trying to just keep a note, the same notebooks, you know, small to medium-sized notebooks that I can put in my purse with me at a pen so I don't have scraps of paper everywhere. <laughs> it would be a lot easier just to keep it in. But, you know, how, I mean, it's not that often that I have a notebook with me ready to go, mm. you know, at the ready. Yes. As the, the Brits say. So I'm, I usually, wherever I find myself, like if I'm in a bar, I'm writing on a cocktail napkin. You know, if I'm in a restaurant, I've, I don't know what, I try to find something or I ask somebody else if they have a piece of paper or something, or maybe I'll write on the back of a, a menu if it's the <laughs> kind of, if it's that kind of menu, not the kind that everybody else is going to see it, yes. you know, but usually I try to have a little notebook with me, you know, so I don't have scraps of paper because that can get confusing mm. and they can get lost, Indeed. you know. And then you would sit down with that material and, and do you mm -hmm. come up with the music first? Or, yeah. Yep. I'd have some lyrics and I'd try to put, before I come up with the music, I have to have some semblance of a verse mm -hmm. or something something like that, you know. 
And then I'll just sit with it, and, you know, using my guitar. I just come kind of strum and play different chords until I just come up with some kind of melody. Mm -hmm. You know, then once I get the melody, then I have to go back and edit to make the words fit with the melody and create a refrain or chorus or refrain. Yeah. You know, and like just organize it and put it together. It should, it's supposed to have a bridge. Uh huh. That was one of my early stories was when I was, this record company guy met with me and told me that none of my songs had bridges. So they weren't finished <laughs> because they didn't have a bridge because he was talking about like the classic pop song mm. is verse, 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 bridge, yep. refrain, back to verse, you know. They follow this certain pattern, and I didn't write like that, mm. you know. So a lot of my songs were just kind of like joy for or change the locks. That's a good example. He he mentioned that one as an example, actually, uh -huh. change the locks. Right. Because it just goes and goes and goes the same thing. Mm. It, there isn't really a refrain. There isn't a bridge. There's, you know. Mm. It's just verses, verse, 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 you know, yeah. and a little, you know, it repeats that I change the locks is kind of the hook thing, but mm. it's, it doesn't follow that pattern, you know, of songwriting. So mm. he said I had to go back to the drawing board that my songs were not finished. They really need, I needed to pay attention to the, putting a bridge in my songs. Mm. Such At which point, <laughs> yes, I went and got, I, I pulled out my Bob Dylan and Neil Young albums and listened to them again, <laughs> just to remind myself and feel okay about my songs not having bridges. Yes. You know, now I talk, now I tell that story and laugh, Yes, you know, because it's so ridiculous. Absolutely. Because one of the Change the Lots was recorded by Tom Petty and another one was Pineola. That was another one he said didn't have a bridge and wasn't finished because it didn't have a bridge. When Daddy told me what happened, I couldn't believe what he just said. Sonny shot himself with a 44 and they found him lying on his bed. I could not speak a single word. That's what got me was. Look, the song is finished, okay? It doesn't matter if it has a fucking goddamn bridge, you know. Exactly. It's finished, you know. So. Mommy and Daddy went over to the house to see what had to be done. They took the sheets off. I loved that you had that, that confidence because really it seemed like record companies were a bit of the bane of your life there for a while. They just yeah. wanted something other or they didn't quite... They didn't know what to do with me. Yeah, that's right. You were sort of considered too country for rock and too rock for country. Yeah. yeah. But you you knew, didn't you? You had you had a clear picture I, of yeah. your music. Because Yeah, because the stuff, the artists I looked up to and listened to, you know, during the 60s and 70s when I was just forming my style and learning how to play and how to sing and everything. Mm. You know, that wasn't an issue during those days. Yep. The artist, you know, it was, just, it was more the artist was the artist and, you know, there were, it, they weren't concerned about what type of music it was or what it was called. Mm. You know, like Bob Dylan did different styles. You know, he had Nashville Skyline and then, you know, he was called folk rock. Mm. They used, I think they should bring folk rock back, that term. Yes. It makes sense. Yeah. That's what I, I feel like that's what I was doing more. Right. Was folk rock, you know, because I started out listening to folk music, mm -hmm. you know, and then I got into country music for a while. Yep. And of course I was into a lot of the rock music from that time and, you know, and to me, when I heard Bob Dylan, I felt like, you know, he put it all together. He put the best of what folk music was with the best of what rock music was, mm. you know, and put it together. 
it's interesting in the book you get an insight into just how broad your musical uh, exposure was growing up. I, there's a lovely yeah. lovely story of your dad taking you down the street and there's a, a blind preacher singing the blues, I guess. Yes. Uh, you speak about artists from sort of Lead Belly through to um, Nina Simone. I mean, it's, it's a very broad yeah. catalogue, I suppose. Do you feel like that? All of that influences your work. I mean, I guess it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So my dad had real, you know, loved a lot of different kinds of music. He was he loved country and jazz and blues, and so did I. So mm. you know, there wasn't a huge big generation gap musically between my my dad and myself. So right, you know, he had he loved Lightning Hopkins. You know, he would go to the record store and buy records and bring those home. And he loved that uh, Ray Charles Modern Sounds and Country Music album that came out. And uh, Bessie Smith. Mm -hmm. I remember he bought a Bessie Smith album that Columbia had put out. It was like the best of her stuff. I think it was a two album set Mm -hmm. of Bessie Smith. And he played it all the time. Right. You know, so it was always just wafting through the house and coming into my brain, mm, mm. you know. I wanted to ask you about him specifically. You released a beautiful album after his death a few years ago and I think have put some of his poetry to music. He was a, yeah. a fabulous poet and read a poem at Bill Clinton's inauguration mm-hmm. Uh it, how did he impact on your, I guess, love of language? Well, just being there, you know, being my father, being a great poet. And he was he was widely admired and respected by a lot of other poets mm-hmm. who would also come to the house and visit. And so I was surrounded by all these great minds, you know, these great thinkers. Mm. And they would hear me play and sometimes I'd go get my guitar and, you know, sing songs for some of my dad's friends and they were always very supportive and, but, you know, they were my first audience kind of, you know, so I set the bar pretty high (laughs) at a young young age, you know, (laughs) because I wanted to be a good writer. I wanted to be a good songwriter, Mm -hmm. you know, more than anything. Mm. The first Bob Dylan album I heard was Highway 61 Revisited. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it just blew my mind. I was I was like 12 going on 13, and I just thought it was the most amazing thing I'd ever heard, you know. And I didn't understand all the lyrics, but it didn't matter. Mm-hmm. I just, I loved the sound of it. And... You walk into the room With a pencil in your hand you see somebody naked And that album cover, that photograph of Bob Dylan on the cover on that album, his wavy hair and yes, just the motorcycle and the, you know, <laughs> it's just the whole thing. Yep, I was sm- I was smitten, <laughs> you know. So I was in love with Bob Dylan when I was twelve, <laughs> <laughs> and it just grew and grew as he put out more albums. You know, I just would soak him up, you know. Fantastic. And just, yeah, I just loved him. Was that the... And still do. Yes. Was that the prompt to you buying a guitar? Because you were about 12 when you when you first started to play that's it. When, yeah, that's when I took lessons. Uh uh-huh. was that age. Yes. That was a big time. It was 1965. It was the height of the folk music boom mm. in the United States, you know, and I was listening to all of it. Mm-hmm. You know, Bob Dylan, but so many other ones too, Gordon Lightfoot and Ian and Sylvia Tyson, you know, mm. and just so many great ones. Joan Baez, of course, Peter, Paul, and Mary. Yes. You know, I just loved all of it. Donovan, Buffy St. Marie. Yep. So there's a yeah. theme with many of these names and that is something I wanted to ask you about and that is sort of protest songs, which I heard a great podcast uh, in which you were invited to sort of list your favourites uh, and there were many, many from sort of Marvin Gaye through to Dylan. I wonder if you see your work as inherently political. 
Well, yeah, a lot of it is. I was saying how I was really inspired by a lot of Bob Dylan's and Phil Oaks political songs, but I found it really challenging to write one myself. I wanted to be able to write more topical songs like Masters of War and, mm. you know, the times they are changing and those wonderful songs that he wrote about that, like with that subject matter, but, you know, they didn't sound like your typical protest songs, mm. you know. But then we were talking about how some of my songs I discovered on my own when I was working on writing songs like that, that a lot of my songs deal with the human struggle, workers' rights and, you know, mm. things like that. And those could be considered topical songs as well. Yes. They're just not as obvious, mm. you know. Like she mentioned my song Fancy Funeral, mm -hmm. which I wrote about, you know, the racket that funeral parlors have fallen into, mm. you know, and how especially elderly people can get caught up in spending their life savings on a funeral. Yes. And that sort of thing, you know. So I wrote a song that deals with that. Which could be, in a mm. sense, is a political song. Certainly. It's, it's about, you know, working class people being sucked into, you know, this bureaucratic corporate crap, you know, yeah. that, yeah, so. Oh, the other one that comes to mind is Man Without a Soul, which yeah, uh, yeah. you released a few years ago, um, inspired mm -hmm. by politics in America. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us a bit about that? Well, I mean, you know, at the time, it was, there was stuff, something happening every day that would just piss you off, you know, just it was just in your face all the time. Mm. You either heard it on the news, on TV, or you read it in the paper, and, you know, it was basically a way of dealing with that, mm. that anger and frustration. Mm. You feel like you, there's nothing you can do and you feel, you know, you feel helpless kind of. Mm. I mean, you know, we've had a lot of stuff going on over here for so long. It's just a mess. Yes. You know, so. Yeah. And, I mean, there is the presidential elections not too far off. It, it's a very interesting time. How's life in National, Nashville day to day? Well, it's good here. You know, they could work on their politics, so, mm -hmm. you know, a little, I mean. Unfortunately, it's known as a red state. Yep. You know, so it'd be good if it went over to blue, but who knows? Mm. There are some good people here, though. Yeah. You know, it's not all like that everywhere. People think, I do a lot of interviews and so many people wonder how I can live in the South because it's all racist and all Republican and it's not. Mm. You know, there are some good people here. Yes, and they who think the same way I do, you know. Mm. So that came th through very strongly in the memoir. Actually, your father saying it's beholden on us to show that Southerners are not yeah. all these cliched images, right? Yeah, yeah. And be proud of where you're from. Be proud of your roots. And mm. I'm sure you've had to deal with that. Maybe being from where you're from, and absolutely, it seems like. Every place has ends up with stereotypes and you have to just, you know, I guess just ignore that or come up with something intelligent to say about it and then just walk on. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, I guess the the ideal is a, you know, a, a healthy discourse, but it does feel yes. sometimes <laughs> so polarised you can't even have a conversation I, or a measured it's just debate. Ridiculous. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. The South is so misunderstood. Mm. That's the best way to put it, I think. Mm. It 
it feels like there's a lot we could talk about in terms of politics <laughs> so very yeah. much. But I, I did want to ask you about one element of, I guess, the division that's happening in America at the moment, and that is the censorship. I know truth is a through line in your work yeah. very much. And the, the, the banning of books, for example, I, I wonder what you think about that. I was just, it's horrible. Mm. I hate it. Mm. it. It's interesting you brought that up because I, the other day I was, had, was getting some ideas for a song about that, about censorship. I don't know what made me, what came into my mind about, I must have read something or heard, I think I, I might have been reading about Flannery O'Connor because you know, she's been questioned a lot about her writing. She's she's from the South and grew up in a certain environment during a certain time. Mm. And her writing is very realistic. It's, it's very just stark, you know. And so she uses the N-word in a lot of her writing, which a lot of people have criticized her for. It's a really tough subject because she's such a great writer. She was a friend of my father's and mm. he considered he considered her his greatest teacher. She was his mentor. And right. you know, I loved her writing. I just read everything that she ever wrote, and just fell in love with it because it, I understood it so well. Mm. It reminded me of, you know, reminded me of where I was living and the way things were around me and, yes. you know, but, you know, the polite, politically correct crowd doesn't approve. So mm. I don't know. That's a hard one. It's, I don't know what to say about that. I mean, if I say the wrong thing, that people are going to think that I, you know, I've seen articles that have come out about Flannery O'Connor. Is she, Flannery O'Connor a racist you know, and all of this. And mm. no, she wasn't a racist. No. But she felt comfortable enough to describe, she described more than other people did about what it was like growing, you know, living in the South mm. where she lived. And, yes, you know, they've tried to ban Tom Sawyer's books, for God's sake. Mark Twain's, I mean, Tom Sawyer, you know, yes, yeah. It's just, you know, that's just... Criminal, I think. Well, language reflects it's, its time, doesn't it? I think that right. that is what is, you know, yeah. since and, and she, ever we wrote. She just, I think I think Flannery O'Connor just took that further than mm. some of the other writers had and yes. she got a lot of criticism for that, you know. But, um, you know, you could look at blues songs and if you got into, what do we want to get into the nitty gritty of all that. I mean, it exists in that, in that music, mm. you know, like there's a lot of, there are a lot of lyrics and a lot of the, like Robert Johnson songs, or there's a little son Jackson song that I sing sometimes called disgusted. Mm -hmm. And it says something like, I'm going to whip my woman like I whip a baby child or something like, you know, yeah, like they, right. all that, all their songs say stuff like that, you know, mm. I mean, but you can't change the song. It's It was written by somebody else during a certain time. Mm. You know, it doesn't make it a bad song. It's still a great song. It's just maybe some people don't like the lyrics, but they just turn it off and don't listen to it. Mm. Mm. I mean, you know, there's no point in banning it just because, you know, somebody feels uncomfortable about it. Mm. It reflects what was happening during a certain time and... Apparently, but, um, Robert Johnson's wife beat him over the head with the frying pan, I understand. Oh, really? You know, so. Wow. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, that was how it was back then, you know. Yeah. He apparently, he died from a jealous husband. He was messing around with this woman, and the woman's husband apparently found out about it and poisoned Robert Johnson. Oh, gosh. That's one of the, one of the stories, right. you know. But... I mean, we probably wouldn't survive a day mm. in, back then and what, you know, during that time that they lived. Mm. Yeah. You know, because we're also, you know, kind of timid and politically correct. Mm. I mean, it's, if you take that too far, it's just going to destroy art altogether.
Well, it's interesting. It reminds me of something your dad said to you, and that was to speak your truth and be as honest as you can, I think, through your songwriting, yeah. which um, which now extends to the book. But I did want to ask you about in 2020 you had a stroke and since then mm-hmm. I understand you've been un- unable to play guitar, uh, but your voice yeah. is stronger. How's life yeah. since then? Well, it's, I mean, I'm, you know, it's day to day. I'm still recovering. I'm still in recovery, but it gets better as time goes on. You know, I had to learn to walk again, Mm. and I couldn't even tie my shoes at one point, which is common when after you've had something like that, a stroke. Um, It just affects, you know, things you do with your hands and legs and arms. Um. So I've had, but I've had a lot of rehab and worked with a lot of physical therapists and I, they started me on that right away. Pre, pretty soon after I got first was in the hospital, they started me on rehab in the hospital. And then when I got out, I had out, did outpatient rehab where they would come to the house and work with me. Yes. So I have to do these hand exercises and. I'm I'm hoping it's going to come, you know, my hand strength is going to improve because my I learned to walk again. So mm. if I did that, I'm hoping that eventually my arms and hands will get better too. Yes. And is the you prognosis know. that you may be able to play guitar again or they're not sure at this stage? Or? Yeah, I think they feel like I could recover 100%. Oh, fantastic. With, within a, It just takes a long time. Yes. But, you know. So I have to just keep doing the exercises and stay with it. I somehow you know. imagine given your determination throughout your career, you will uh, absolutely <laughs> achieve yeah. that goal. Yes. That's how I feel too. Yeah. yeah. And so you're looking at touring again and you have a new album about to hit. Yeah. I know that Bruce Springsteen played with you on one of the tracks. Can you tell us about yeah. collaborating with him? Yeah. He's just so great. He's such a wonderful person and just down to earth and very sweet and very, you know, um, nurturing and Uh nice to be around. And, well, we were collaborating on a couple of songs with my husband, Tom, who's also my manager, Mm -hmm. and Jesse Mallon would come in from New York City from time to time and work with us on stuff. Right. And um, we were working on, well, let's see, Bruce sang on um, Rock and Roll Heart. Mm-hmm. He sang on that, and he sang on New York Comeback. Yes. And and Tom said, piped up and said, wouldn't it be great if we could get Bruce on these songs, you know, singing on them? And Jesse, who knows everybody in New York City, uh-huh. They call him the unofficial mayor of Greenwich <laughs> Village, you know, because right. <laughs> he's got all these connections and and stuff. And so Jesse said, "I think I can might be able to make that happen." Fantastic. So he went he went back to New York and got in touch with some of Bruce's people, and they asked Bruce, and he said yes, he'd love to do it. And his, and Bruce's wife Patty also wonderful Patty Skialfa. Yes, yeah, and so they. We sent them the tracks. They weren't able to come in the studio with us in Nashville. but So we sent them the tracks where they live. They went into a studio there mm-hmm. and just put the vocals down. And we didn't tell them what to do or anything. They just, you know, just improvised and just did whatever they wanted to. Wonderful. And it came out great, I think. It does. You it know, <laughs> every time I hear Bruce's voice, it stands out so much, you know, and it just still thrills me to this day when I hear his <laughs> voice on there. I just get all excited, like, oh, you know. Yes. Well, you've sung with a lot of amazing artists over the years, Willie yeah. Nelson, Emmy Lou Harris, uh, Tom mm-hmm. Petty. Is there anyone that you still would like that you have in that, you know, I wish I could play with this person? Is there yeah. anyone out there? Uh, I love Chrissy Hind. Yes. 
you know, and we've got, we're getting to be friends more and more now. We've been texting back and forth and, and we, she sat in sometimes on my shows and she sat in on my song, Sweet Side. Uh huh. She sat in on that song with me a couple of times and she would take a verse and, you know, she loves that song so much and she's, she's kind of become like my big sister. Whoa. You know, fantastic. And, yeah, she's great. And I just, I love her voice so much and her records, the pretenders, those first pretenders records really inspired me and influenced me a lot. Mm. In fact, I remember when you, was it when you signed with Rough Trade, you you referenced them as, as that's, yeah. that's what I want to do. I don't want to do yeah. what you guys in um, other record that's companies it, think you want me to do. This is what I want to do. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I was playing, it was just me and my acoustic guitar. So I was playing, you know, I had a guitar sort of by default, you mm. know, and you know, so they immediately just because voice and guitar, you know, that means Americana or whatever. Yes. You know, alternative something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're quite um, scathing about some of these labels in the book, um, alt country and yeah, you don't like to be pigeonholed clearly and rightly so. Well, because it caused so many problems in the beginning when I was trying to get signed to a record label. Mm. You know, because they felt the need to pigeonhole it and call it something, mm. you know, and, and all that did was serve to just kind of delay things. Yes. You know, while they had to figure out what to do about what to do with it, they would hold off on signing me to begin with. Right. You know, because they wanted to make sure they had everything sorted out, you know, to, um, I guess, to promote it or whatever. Mm. There's a reason they call it the music business, you know. Yeah. It's a business, just like anything else, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, but I've had good, I've had good luck with labels overall, though, you know. Mm. I mean, Rough Trade was great to me. You know, they re- they signed me when nobody else would. Mm. I mean, my phone rang one day, and it was Robin Hurley from the Rough Trade label, and they had heard this demo tape I'd done, which was floating around, and somehow they'd gotten a copy of it. And he said, we love your voice and we love your songs. Would you like to make a record? You know, I mean, it was really basically that simple. And I said, yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, so so I did, and I was, I'm glad I did, you know. We're very glad you did too, I've got to say. It's been an incredible career. I wonder, is there a Thank chance you. we'll see you in Australia anytime soon? Next year. Okay, it says next year we're going. Excellent. Back over there. Oh, fantastic. So, I mean, We're leaving. We're, we're going back to Europe. We're leaving June 10th uh-huh. to go back to Europe. Oh, that's exciting. To, wow. It must be exhausting touring, but um, uh, you love it. Clearly you Yeah. You, I mean, you have to find a way to love it because there's no getting out of it. <laughs> you know, yeah. you have to go out and promote your product. Absolutely, you know, so. absolutely. Yeah. And um, that's very exciting to hear that you you will be coming to these shores next year. Um, I think we're nearly yeah. out of time, but um, I should mention that the uh, the book is out here on July fifth, uh, so it's yet to be released. But it's done very well oh. in the states, hasn't it? It's um, yes, it's getting a lot of great press, and people are really liking it, which makes me happy. Absolutely. So, oh, it's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for making time to have a chat with Cinder. And, um, uh, yeah, look, you're welcome. Look forward to seeing you on stage here next okay. year. Okay, thank you. Cheers. Okay, cheers. Thanks so much. Good Weekend Talks is brought to you by the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Subscriptions power our newsrooms. To support independent journalism, search subscribe Sydney Morning Herald or The Age. And if you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe, rate and comment wherever you get your podcasts. This episode of Good Weekend Talks is produced by Julia Carr-Katzel. Editing from Conrad Marshall. Tom McKendrick is head of audio. And Katrina Strickland is the editor of Good Weekend. Good Weekend.